Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I think I've done this intro a few times over the last half an hour, but if you have just joined us, my name is Mel Brown and I'm the community Sorry, and I'm the Community Engagement Librarian here at Hobson's Bay Libraries. I just um, minimised my screen and I thought it disappeared altogether for a moment. I'd like cut myself off, so apologies when I stopped and hesitated there for a moment. Um, so, um, I would like to welcome you all to our very first online event. It is very exciting for all of us. Um, and I would like to begin by acknowledging uh, that depending on where you join me from tonight, we are potentially gathered on the traditional land of many peoples. Uh, from my home, where I host you from, um, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri. And I would like to pay respect to their elders, past, present and future, as well as those of the wild, wider Kulin Nation whose boundaries cover the Hobsons Bay City Council area, where many of you are likely joining us from tonight. Uh, but I don't want to exclude all traditional owners whose lands we may be communally standing on this evening. Now, Council acknowledges that long before this area was known as Hobsons Bay, our First Nations people had named its places, hosted ancient ceremonies where learning flourished, knowledge and resources were exchanged, and healthy communities and relationships were sustained and adapted to the changing environments. We recognise the unique role that diverse Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from many lands continue to play in the life of this city. We pay homage to that this evening, coming together to learn to share, to sustain and to adapt. So thank you very much to those of you who have joined. Um, just because we've probably had a few more people, I'm just going to go through a few very quick things. Um, this event will be recorded tonight and we will be taking some snapshots of the audience on screen. If you don't want to be in any of these, please make sure your video is turned off and you can turn off your video by clicking on the video button on the bottom left of your screen. Um, you can also change your name to something less identifiable if you would prefer as well by clicking on your image. Um, the mute, I've already told you I've muted everybody um, and so we will be doing that to minimise back background sound. Of course we are encouraging everybody to ask questions um, so you will be able to unmute yourself at any time to ask a question however I am requesting that you use the raise hand button to let me know that you have a question um, and you can find that in your manage participants option at the bottom of your screen. I'll be keeping an eye on that chat during Kat's presentation um, and I will then pass over to let Kat know that you have a question. You can then unmute yourself, ask your question and then we do ask that you mute yourself again at the end just so we can keep all those background noises out. Um, so I mentioned the chat in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, you guys can chat to your, each other as well during tonight's event. You can ask questions to Kat, to myself. Um, but somebody might ask a question that you might also have a response to so feel free to pop in your own suggestions in there as well. Now this event is being brought to you today by Hobson's Bay Libraries and the Enviro Centre. Um, we, like everyone else, are waiting to hear what's going to happen with restrictions but until the time comes that we do reopen I would like to let everyone know that we do have a book a book home delivery service available for library members within Hobson's Bay and you can find that on our website libraries.hobsonsbay.vic.gov.au forward slash services forward slash delivery dash request. I will put that in my chat in the ch chat once I finish my intro and hand over to Kat so it will be there available for you. Now all of the Enviro Centre resources that are normally available to you to borrow in the Alterna Library are all available through that book of book uh, service as well. So things like our power mates, our leak detectors, thermal cameras, binoculars, spotting scopes are all there as well. Um, so when you fill out your request of delivery, you can uh, request these items. Um, if you're not sure what you want to read, you know, you want to, you know, maybe pick up some, some gardening while we're in isolation, um, but not quite sure what titles, feel free to pop some notes in there and I can put together some titles for you as well. Uh, but our library team can do that for any topic that you have out there and if it's not the sustainability one so please feel free to um to ask us for our suggestions uh, we also have a really extensive e-library so if you haven't already please make sure you head to the library website and hit the e-library tab along the top um, in there there's 
magazines and books that you can read, but you can listen to books, you can watch documentaries, learn a language. There's so much in there for everyone. So if you haven't already found that, please feel free. If you're having trouble downloading any of that stuff, give us a call. Our phone lines are still operational during business hours, so we can uh, run you through that as well. Now tonight's event, while we're all here, uh, we're currently in International Composting Awareness Week, which goes from the 3rd to the 9th of May. It was International Permaculture Day last Sunday, the 3rd of May, and Saturday the 2nd, which just gone, was of course World Naked Gardening Day. Now, especially that last one, I think these dates are planned with enormous Northern Hemisphere in mind, uh, but a big round of applause to all the Melburnians I know who got involved in World Naked Gardening Day on what was a very cold and brisk Melbourne day. Um, so kudos to everybody who did. Um, but I guess in, in 2020, um, all the above I've just mentioned is overshadowed from the resurgence that gardening has had in the wake of COVID-19. I've never had anybody ask to buy my chooks before. Eggs all the time. Chooks never. Um, I think I'm up to about five people now who've asked to buy my chooks off me. Uh, but we don't want to see this newfound love of gardening being a phase that it disappears when COVID-19 does. We want it to be a lasting legacy of the time when we as a society thought Hmm, maybe I should know how to grow some food and get better at doing it. So please join me in welcoming Hobson's Bay City Council's own Kat Lavers. She's a My Smart Garden Officer and she's a permaculture teacher. And she's going to showcase some successful gardens and teach us how we can all have that same success. Thank you and welcome Kat. Thank you so much, Mel. Mel doing a great job tonight running her first online event. It's really nerve wracking. So <laughs> good on you, Mel. Thank you for organising it. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in from your lounge rooms and your home offices and your couch. Um, we're um, uh, going to go through a couple of things tonight. And I am wearing a couple of hats, which I don't usually do. But as someone who does teach permaculture and as someone who runs the program, My Smart Garden for Council, I think it is appropriate tonight. And we're going to talk a bit more about some of the resources that you have access to as residents in Hobson's Bay, um, as well as going through, of course, permaculture. So tonight's session is going to be uh, a, a quick introduction to what, what is this thing called permaculture, which is surprisingly hard to define, I will warn you in advance. And then we're going to go through some examples of permaculture systems that are in um, Melbourne and mm. outside I can't Melbourne. Go so, far, I listen. Um, so we'll look at some um, examples at different scales. <laughs> We've got Misha there. <laughs> um, you trying to meet everyone, Mel? Let me try meeting everyone. Cool. Hopefully that worked. Yeah. So we're just going to keep the um, keep the mute on, folks, just to reduce any background noise interrupting us tonight. But there'll be opportunities throughout if you want to unmute and then ask questions. Um, so yeah, we'll look at examples from different scales. And I'm hoping that by going through a few different examples, you'll see lots of ideas for different scales and maybe using some things that you've already got at home. And you just have a chance to kind of dip in and see what other people are doing um, while still staying um, very much at home, of course. And so after that, we'll um, look at just a couple of um, quick tips on what uh, you can plant right now, which is the question I've answered about you know, 50 times in the last week. Uh, so hopefully, that, you know, if you're wondering, you know, what do I put in right now, we can um, give you some quick answers to that. And then there'll be a fair bit of Q&A time at the end, um, recognising that um, I'm not quite sure what your particular needs are from tonight's session. So um, hopefully we can catch some of those at the end if they haven't really come up in the the presentation side of things. And so I hope that sounds okay. I'm looking at a bunch of names in boxes on my screen, a couple of people with their video on, which is really nice. It just helps me feel like I'm, I'm actually with a group rather than speaking to my screen. Um, so I hope that sounds good to you. I'm getting a couple of thumbs up and waves. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in and share my screen um, and we'll get this, uh, get this little permaculture party started. So let me bring this up and Mel, just give me some quick feedback that it's all going okay, um, that you can see that presentation. And uh, yep, looking good. So, all right, I'll kick into it. Uh, okay, so firstly, you're gonna start with um, the, the big question, which is what is permaculture? 
And um, lots of people have heard of permaculture before. Uh, lots of people understand permaculture as a type of gardening, um, which is, it is and it isn't as well. So organic gardening is um, more than permaculture and permaculture is more than organic gardening. But it tends to be the way that people first encounter this word. And certainly there's a bit of a bias towards gardening in permaculture's roots. So this, um, this word is a contraction of the words permanent and agriculture. And it came about that the concept of permaculture came about in the 70s when we had an oil um, shock. Uh, and so around that time, there was lots of activity and people really interested in self-sufficiency and producing um, from the land, growing for their own needs. Uh, and around that time, two Australians, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, uh, together collaborated on this um, new, or not, I should say not new, but <laughs> a way of describing a form of agriculture where um, it was using more perennial plants as opposed to annual plants. So the, the way that we conventionally grow a lot of our food involves annual plants where we need to replant them uh, every season or at least every year. And uh, in doing that, we expose the soil where it, it often does get a bit degraded. And also it's a lot of work for us. <laughs> uh, and, um, and also, uh, I guess, doesn't have the resilience of many perennial plants. Doesn't have those large, well-established, deep root systems that allow it to be stable through um, extreme weather events, for example, uh, and changes in the labor. So by using more perennial plants, like fruit and nut trees, for example, and a much wider variety of plants than um, we, we currently eat in a typical diet, we um, arrive at a more resilient, stable source of agriculture. So that was the original concept behind permaculture, permanent agriculture, permanent permaculture, but it actually has very quickly evolved into something a lot more than that. And so today I've got a definition here for you. It's just one of quite a few different definitions. Uh, but the definition I've, I've pulled out is consciously designed landscapes, which mimic the patterns and relationships found in nature while yielding an abundance of food, fiber and energy for the provision of local needs. So some things to pull out in there are it is really focused on producing for human needs and that's of course not to discount the need of other uh, creatures and other species uh, to survive and thrive on the planet uh, but permaculture is about how do we how do we do human societies uh, with much smaller footprint than we have um, currently. So it is focused around providing for human needs in um, what we could say is the most sustainable way possible. They are consciously designed landscapes. So permaculture is a process of design. And that's something I often repeat again and again, um, because that, that's the bit that makes it permaculture. Uh, there's a design process that we go through in order to end up with these fabulous um, productive systems. And permaculture, of course, um, pe people for thousands of years have been uh, doing something like this and of course not calling it permaculture, um, but uh, certainly the way that uh, traditional um, and, and older uh, societies produced for their needs would fit very well within a permaculture framework. So it's really drawing inspiration from um, those techniques uh, and then translating them into our modern context uh, and also trying to mimic nature as well as much as possible. And um, so I'll go to explain that a little bit more before we get started. But the, the uh, flower image that you've got in front of you there is what we call the permaculture domains. And that's just to say that while um, it's most common to apply permaculture to land and nature stewardship, which is the green petal, people are applying permaculture in lots of other ways. In the way we design buildings, in the way that we do education, um, people are experimenting using permaculture principles in health. Uh, it's of course quite topical at the moment. So I'm really zooming in on that land and nature stewardship petal tonight. Uh, but just know that if you go on to learn more about permaculture, it is a lot broader and there's um, a lot to explore. 
Um, so to explain a bit more about the design process with permaculture, um, it, I won't go too much into this, but just to kind of um, help maybe explain the way that we approach things in permaculture. Uh, it's in contrast to what I'd say is a default approach. Now, um, a default approach might or often starts with a solution and then tries to fit it in best um, to a particular context. So for example, a lot of people go, I'd like to grow some food. Um, and so I'd like to install a raised vegetable garden. So that would be the, an example of the technique. And then we might go, oh, okay, um, where's the best place for a raised vegetable garden on the site? And so then you do a little bit of design, you go, where's the sun coming from? Um, where's the tap? Uh, and people might think a little bit about principles and ethics, um, but it's, it's a bit more about the, the techniques and where to put them. And you can see I'll put an arrow in there, start here that's upside down. Um, and that's because I think this process is upside down. So I'll show you now what um, a, a more ideal permaculture design approach would be. And um, it's actually starting from the reverse. So in permaculture, we tend to talk and think a lot about our ethics and principles. Uh, and we try and find the best compromise solution um, that fits those ethics and the principles. And we go through a process of design. So in this case, we might be asking a lot of questions about goals. What are the goals here behind this desire to grow food? What is it that you want to achieve by growing food? And we might find out that it's um, for, for whoever this person is, it's about growing a little bit to eat and maybe teaching a child where food comes from. And then we can go, oh, that's interesting. So, um, so you're maybe a parent, you don't have a lot of time, there's a million other things to do. So is a raised vegetable garden bed the best technique for this context? And we might actually decide after some conversation that, well, actually, no, maybe it's just easier if we put in some really hardy fruit trees that after the first year or two are not going to require so much care and attention. So that's one example just to say that we um, start from a base of ethics and principles, we move into a design process, and from that we decide which techniques and strategies are most appropriate. There's a little bit of a, a turnaround of what might be a default approach. And it's the last slide I'm going to throw at you before we go into some, some examples. I just wanted to mention these ethics and principles again. Uh, that really form the heart of permaculture. So you don't need to absorb all of these or even any of these. I'll bring up some examples as we go through the case studies. I uh, just know that these are, I guess, guiding, um, guiding principles that help us to work out what the most appropriate technique and strategy might be uh, in this particular situation. Okay, so I've got a couple of case studies for you tonight. And um, the first one, and probably the longest one, is going to be my place in Melbourne, which is, of course, the place that I know best and can um, speak the most about. Uh, and then I've got some other ones for you that are scattered around um, the state. So my place, the plumbery, started out as um, a pretty standard urban garden. Uh, and it's, um, as you can see here, <laughs> it's got an old falling down shed and it's got some lawn which wasn't very happy and um, yeah pretty standard place and then okay there's there's a sort of after photo after being converted now I will say this is taken by a friend who's a professional photographer and um, that's got a nice shiny edge to it because of that uh, but yeah it's um it's been converted to be a little productive permaculture system um, now, I have got a little bit of wood video footage here, which I'm just going to play you a tiny bit of. This is from um, the ABC, who came and did a little video segment on the place. But it, I think, helps you to get a sense of the sort of scale that we're looking at. So our block is um, about 280 square metres, which is a 14th of an acre. And the actual productive space that we're growing most of the food in is only about 10 metres by 10 metres. So about 100, um, 100 square metres. Uh, so let's just do a little bit of a zoom over the top. I find it a bit sad, my place actually looks better from up high <laughs> than it does at ground level. 
sometimes. And you're welcome to watch this later if you want to. I just thought I'd, it was fun to show you a bit of video footage as well. So we grow a mix of um, vegetables and fruit. We've also got eggs from our quail, who, you, who you'll meet later. Um, been doing a bit of mushroom growing recently, which has been quite fun, on some uh, wood shavings. There you go, just between those two fence lines. It's quite a, a long and skinny block. Um, and there's a, a couple of before photos again for you. All right, so I'm gonna pause that. Let's um, go to a bit of a still photo where I can um, where I can show you a few things. So um, we've used the design process in this garden. Um, we talk a lot in permaculture about uh, going from patterns to details. So getting the big picture stuff right uh, before we try and work out small things like where we're going to put tomatoes this year. So one of the bigger picture patterns that we've um, gotten uh, our teeth into at the plumery is where the sun is moving at different times of year. So this photograph is looking from the north to the south, as um, the solar panels will, uh, will show you. And um, so this is taken at almost at the height of summer, at the summer solstice. And uh, at this time of year, hopefully you can see, we've got some sun on the veggies, but we've actually got a lot of trees uh, in a bit of a bubble around the garden. So we've identified that one of the design challenges that we have in Melbourne is this really, really strong sun in summer, which is actually a lot and too much really for veggies if they're exposed to it for that um, entire period of sun at the height of summer. So what our design does is actually provides a bit of morning and afternoon shade on the vegetables. And so when the sun's at the, um, you know, extreme end of the day in summer where it is often baking hot, we get this nice um, shade cast on some of the veggies. And we also get a wind break from those fruit trees, uh, which softens some of that really harsh hot wind that can come in. And that means we don't have to use quite as much water as um, a garden that's fully exposed. Um, so we've got this uh, annual garden bed system in the centre that you can see in here. And we've got a perennial bubble that runs all the way around it, uh, which is nuts and fruit um, and lots of little berries and um, flowers under the canopy. Um, so I'll show you a bit of a contrasting photo now. Unfortunately, I haven't um, learned how to take great photos yet <laughs> um, all year round. So I haven't got a good one from exactly the same angle, but you can see here close to the middle of winter, uh, where the garden really opens out so we get a lot more sun coming in and that's um, just an example of getting those big picture patterns right. Uh, we also have this lovely grapevine which goes on this north facing pergola in front of the house and this is almost a cliche in permaculture in um, southeastern Australia having north and west facing walls covered by a grapevine. So you can see in this photograph that we get uh, full light coming through in the winter and that um, does hit the house wall which is actually now a window and um, brings in all that beautiful warmth for us and then um, if I jump back whoops, sorry jump back um, you can see we get a lovely shady room all through the summer um, so we're not just talking about creating a good little what we call microclimate for the garden we're also creating a microclimate for the house so that means that we're not, in, not using as much energy uh, to keep ourselves comfortable throughout the year as well. Uh, so, so yeah, a few more things and of course we can look at questions later um, in the session. Uh, but we get our big picture design right and then we start thinking about our, our smaller scale design. And uh, I just wanted to show you one of the examples here of um, how we do our vegetable garden design. And I have a bit of a planting plan that I've evolved over the years, which is really carefully tailored to what we like to use in the kitchen and what grows really well in our garden. So um, this is just one bed. And on the left, you can see I've got these big circles to represent five different tomatoes. I've worked out I can only fit five tomatoes in my vegetable garden. So I work pretty hard at saving great seed and finding varieties that work really well for us. And then you can see on the right hand side what that bed actually looks like when it's planted out. Um, so we've got those tomatoes in a bamboo trellis where they're going to fill out and take over. And then in the meantime, we've got 
little lettuce plants in there, uh, lots of wild rocket, and under those um, bottle cloches there's some basil that's going to come through as the season warms up a little bit. Uh, so not everyone does uh, this level of detailed planning in permaculture, of course, um, but it's just an example of um, the way that we can think about design on really large and also quite small scales. Uh, one of the other permaculture principles is producing no waste. And um, one of my favourite examples is my uh, seed raising setup, which is pretty much all recycled, except for that um, spray bottle that you can see on the left. Um, so obviously this is a barbecue and um, there were about six being thrown out in the street at Hard Rubbish when I picked this one up. So we had a choice of six barbecues to choose from. So we chose the really sexy one with really nice timber <laughs> and um, retrofitted that up to be with an angle grinder and cut out some panels. And that's um, just some scrap um, plastic from, I think, a, a mattress or something that we got um, that's attached with some magnets. And that folds down, obviously, um, to become a, um, a lid. Uh, so the, the punnets that you see there are all recycled. Um, the seed raising mix that I've used is actually our garden soil. Uh, so that's, um, uh, yeah, nothing's been brought in to produce that. The tags on the seeds are an old Venetian blind um, that's been cut up to form the tags. Um, and you only ever need to find one of those on the side of the road once, by the way, and you've got a lifetime supply of, um, of uh, seed raising tags. And then on the right hand side over here, we've got a, a cat litter tray that I found in hard rubbish and scrubbed out. And um, that is really helpful, I found in summer when you've got um, quite hot weather and you need to get these little seedlings through some hot days and you can't water them every five minutes. So we'll put a, maybe an inch or at least a centimetre of water in there and that just gets drunk up by those seedlings over the day. Um, so the only thing that is not recycled in this photo uh, is the water bottle. And I've actually found a much better solution than a fancy spray bottle, bottle now. I just have um, a, about a, a litre old plastic water bottle and then I um, heat up a pin over a little candle flame and poke a few holes in the top of that lid uh, and then fill that up with water and that's a lovely gentle spray and it's a lot faster than using the spray that I've got in the picture. Um, so yeah producing no waste and, and using what you've got around you is a big thing in permaculture. One of our other principles is using biological resources, using and valuing biological resources. Uh, that's not the way I see possums, by the way, this is the way I see possums. You know, little bandits that come in and try and um, destroy all of our fruit trees. We, we have a terrible possum problem on this particular block. Uh, I tried initially uh, sharing produce with them and um, growing them their own silver bee patch, uh, which they gladly accepted and then they learnt to eat everything and they were eating bark off our fruit trees and breaking branches and <laughs> and um, yeah so very very challenging for us. We have also faced rodents over time which is something that gardeners don't often like to talk about uh, but the better you get at growing food um, the more uh, rodents start to uh, cause you issues and um, so one of our permaculture principles is small and slow solutions and um, so sometimes these principles are held in tension and it can be interesting to navigate your way through. Uh, so what we've actually ended up doing in this case, after trying netting um, and after trying snap traps for rodents, um, our possums, by the way, learnt to break through netting, which is very unfortunate. Uh, so after tearing our hair out for a little while, what we have ended up doing is installing a ping string, which is a small electric fence, a, a very low voltage domestic electric fence, um, which if you look very closely, you'll see at the top of the fence line in this photograph. Um, now this is actually sold for people to help keep your own cat or dog inside your garden or keep other people's <laughs> cats um, or dogs out of your garden. And it's also sold for possums as well. So in this case, it's not um, a small and slow solution as in like a, a simple, um, you know, cheap um, 
low tech option. So it's not that, um, but it is appropriate because we have tried all of those other sorts of things. And um, this has sold our solved our possum problem virtually overnight, which is just incredible. And what it's also done is allowed us to um, think about our ethics. And, um, you know, so obviously one of my ethics is looking after native animals as well as much as we can. So I had an internal ethical debate. Um, but what we are now doing is allowing um, the cat to roam outside at night within this protected uh, electric fence area. Um, so that the cat can then actually control um, rodents within that perimeter. Uh, so yeah, after much consideration and of course um, understanding that cats can be incredibly damaging for native wildlife, uh, we have come to this sort of compromise solution and it's been really highly effective for us. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is one example of a, a design approach that then um, hopefully yields some results to you. And uh, I've seen a couple of things pop up in the chat around what other people do for possums. I will say we, like, we've tried so many things, but I have just never seen possums do the amount of damage that they do in our block. Um, yeah, they're, they're um, almost different creatures to the ones that are in the rest of Melbourne. So we needed a pretty severe solution to, um, to help uh, allow us to produce food. Okay, so uh, what else? So um, one of the other permaculture principles is, um, well, again, producing no waste. And um, so one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about is water in our climate. And um, what we try and do is use all of our grey water um, and, and not letting grey water leave our site unless it's been filtered and treated by the soil. Uh, so we don't always achieve all of that, but we, we try. Uh, and we've had some amazing results with um, using grey water on fruit trees. So I thought I would show you some of our lovely um, produce. Now grey water, uh, there's a guy called Art Ludwig, uh, who is probably one of the foremost experts on grey water. And I'm just going to type his name for you in the chat for anyone who's interested in looking him up. Um, he has uh, a business called Oasis Design in the States and has written some really, really excellent books on grey water. And Art says that the shower water and the clothes washing water from one person is probably enough for about four medium sized fruit trees. And um, what's interesting about that number is that we. Um, we found that our relatively small, probably not even medium sized fruit trees are producing, once they get going, about 20 to 30 kilos of fruit each. So if we multiply, say, 20 by 4, um, we get to, you know, 80 kilos of fruit. Um, and if we add, you know, one extra tree or the, the production goes up, what, what actually happens is you get really close to the recommended daily fruit intake for one person. So it's quite exciting and grey water is just this phenomenal resource that we've got out there. I have a couple of fruit trees that um, weren't doing very well, they weren't productive and the moment that we started directing shower water to them uh, they just burst into production and um, we've had many many kilos of fruit from them. And so we use grey water um, safely and appropriately and I'm happy to ask more questions about that later. Uh, but yeah, using that rather than using um, mains water as much as possible fits really nicely into those permaculture ethics and principles. Uh, I thought I'd show you um, some more of our fruit here. Uh, I've um, been going around and doing pruning a little bit late, admittedly, uh, but I thought I would put up a picture of our almond tree uh, on the left there for you, which is looking in fine form, if I do say so myself, after its um, haircut. And um, that's part of a, a perennial border, as I was pointing out in the photographs before, that has got quite a few different layers. So we're actually um, uh, doing a kind of a forest garden approach where we have understories and smaller shrubs in between some of these larger trees. Um, I've just seen a question from Christine. Hello, Christine. Where are you getting your grey water from? So that it's water that comes from our shower and it's water that comes from our clothes washing machine. And we also have 
a bunch of buckets around that are catching water from things like outdoor sinks or rinse water from the kitchen sink. Um, so not the really greasy stuff, but um, any rinse water from washing uh, vegetables and so on. Uh, so very, very easy to uh, just put those sorts of water onto healthy soil um, without any treatment, uh, as long as you haven't stored them for longer than 24 hours. Um, so at the moment we're, um, we're about to tuck into a whole tree of persimmons, so you can see in the top right hand corner. And then after the persimmons are done, we'll be moving on to the mandarins that you can see below. So this is another, uh, I guess, it, example of how um, the place has been designed. And um, what often happens with home gardens is um, people go, um, you know, pick a few fruit trees from the nursery and then end up with a lot of fruit at some times a year and not much fruit at other times of year. And um, so what we've done with this design and what I try and do with all designs really is making sure that uh, we don't have all our fruit cropping at once and we actually have a succession of fresh fruit that's able to be picked ripe off the tree um, for as much of the year as possible. And we're really lucky in Melbourne, there's actually no time of year where you can't have fresh fruit coming out of your garden. Uh, but it does require a little bit of attention to detail and planning in particular for um, the periods of winter and spring when there aren't as many uh, cropping fruit trees. So the mandarin tree in our garden is quite significant because there isn't as much winter fruit. And um, I've just propagated a mulberry tree that fruits very, very early in spring, which is going to fill a bit of a gap for me around um, early November. Um, so that, just an example of um, what you can do with design. So we absolutely love preserving, but it is work and it's a lot easier just to pick fresh fruit straight off the tree. Uh, so something we can really design for with a bit of effort. Uh, just before you go on, we've just had a few questions uh, just confirming about the grey water. Is it good mm. to use uh, regarding phosphates? Um, and yeah, so another one from Demi, the water from washing is okay for the garden? Sure, yeah. Okay, so when we're using grey water, it's obviously quite important to make sure we keep the water as clean as possible. And um, so some of the things that can end up in grey water are fats uh, and chemicals and things like phosphate, um, which often is a component of laundry powders. Um, so firstly, with things like fats, um, we can just make sure that we don't um, put those down the pipe um, as much as possible. So for example, we don't have a lot of very heavily fatty food here anyway, but um, if we do fry something, we might wipe that pan out with some newspaper and then um, either compost that um, or burn it in our uh, wood stove, for example. Um, for chemicals, of course, we just want to make sure we choose the most simple, uh, safe products that we possibly can. And actually, in the sink photo that you can see in front of you, if you look at the uh, shelf above the sink with the produce on it, just tucked into the right hand corner there, you'll see a really simple bar of soap. And um, that just like the simplest, cheapest soap, um, hopefully palm oil free and <laughs> ethical. Uh, but the simplest soap that you can find is actually what we use for hand washing and also what we use for washing um, up in the kitchen as well, which is often a bit of a surprise. Uh, so we do use that extensively. And one of the reasons we use it is because it's very um, simple and it's easy for soil organisms to break down. We steer well clear of the, um, the old morning fresh and some other kind of strange detergents that smell strongly and have bright colours. That sort of thing um, might not be necessarily dangerous for you, but it's unnecessary to, um, to load up your garden soil with that sort of chemical. So we try and avoid those. Um, and then, so uh, Christine was asking about phosphate. Uh, phosphorus is a key plant nutrient and um, the phosphate free is quite important if you're using your water to water native plants. It's less of a problem if you're using it to water um, food plants uh, because they do use a lot of that phosphorus. Having said that though, we do try and use um, liquid soaps because they tend to have less uh, salts in them. And um, yeah, salt, of course, is another thing you want to avoid putting in your grey water as much as possible. 
um, so yeah, we, we still try and use the simplest, um, cleanest ways of um, having soap uh, as possible. But phosphate's not as big a problem for a food garden as it is for a native garden. It's a, a bit of a long answer, Christine. I hope that was okay. Uh, and I can see, Kim, you've got a question too. Do you water fruit trees in the cool months? Um, I check the soil moisture throughout winter and it can often get really quite dry. It does depend, of course, on the rainfall that we're having. Uh, but occasionally I, I will need to still water, especially vegetables that are active. Uh, but I may top up the water around even deciduous dormant fruit trees uh, if we haven't had a lot of um, real soaking rain. Um, uh, especially if we've got that water coming in, um, in our rain tanks and we don't want to let that overflow if our soil has any room to absorb it. So constantly just trying to make sure the water gets held in the soil rather than lost down a stormwater drain. Uh, so get it up to, you know, real full field capacity, full moisture capacity uh, to prepare it for the coming warmer months. Uh, I'll move on, but I'm really happy to come back to grey water because it's such a, an interesting and important topic at the end. Um, so I thought I would just show you that the sink, and I get very excited about my sink, um, not everybody does, <laughs> but uh, this is another example of producing no waste uh, while also setting up a system that really helps with your um, productive garden. So in this picture, again, basically all of it is secondhand or salvage. We've got baskets from op shops, we've got um, a rod that was a broomstick handle that I found uh, on the side of the road, um, we've got the silver splashback, which is actually an old um, sign that was um, pulled out of a skip. Um, the produce shelf is um, part of an old bread crate that we've hacked into a, a third and screwed to the wall. That's a, a really lovely way of having a, a, a um, way of your produce drying um, and dripping back into the sink. Um, the sink was from the tip shop. Uh, the timbers are out of skips from um, other people's renovations. Uh, so actually the only new thing in this picture, I think, is the um, plumbing underneath the sink to bring the water up into the tap. And of course we catch this water in buckets and then tip it back on some of the plants that are near the sink. Uh, and yes, we do weigh our produce. So you can see here we've got the scales. And I think earlier in the presentation I did put up our produce stash. Uh, so this Little property is producing, um, or the record so far, 428 kilos of herbs and veggies and fruit and eggs. Um, and um, yet yeah, doing that with around about four hours of work uh, on average uh, a week throughout the year. Um, okay, let's move on now. Yes, and so most of the action at this time of year is indoors and we've been busy um, channeling our inner squirrels and um, putting things away for the cooler, leaner months in the winter. So we've got a, another full shelf of passata and um, lots of grape juice on the top shelf. And then we've got a fruit shelf with dried fruits and bottled fruits and then a shelf um, full of pickles and chutneys and um, sauces and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I should warn you, if you're thinking about getting into permaculture, you will never, ever need to buy chutney again <laughs> in your whole life. <laughs> it's um, something that we just get given far more than we could use and also produce some of ourselves at uh, some of our own. Um, okay, so that, yeah, that's the um, pantry area. Uh, the, the top little white goods box is, is our fridge, that little square. And um, I guess one of the things that happens when you have a really productive garden is so much of your produce is coming fresh uh, that your garden is actually your refrigerator and your eggs are coming fresh and so you're eating them quickly and they don't need to go in the fridge. Uh, so your fridge actually can be very, very small. And um, if I have to choose, which I hopefully won't ever have to, I would much rather have the chest freezer that's underneath it than have an actual fridge. Uh, the chest freezer is um, far more valuable to us uh, at this stage. Um, okay, and um, so finally, I, I thought I'd introduce you to my quail. So another design challenge that we've had at the plumbery is a legacy of leaded soil 
uh, so soil contamination. And um, we know that through testing and anyone who is unsure about their soil, I'm gonna put in the chat window where you can get your soil tested very, very affordably. And that's through a program called Veggie Safe at Macquarie University. Um, so we know that our soil has a level of lead in it that makes it uh, dangerous for us to do some things. And one of those things would be growing leafy greens and root vegetables, uh, which is the reason why we've had raised beds installed uh, at the plumbery. Um, we do know that uh, fruits are very unlikely to have any lead transferred into them. So uh, thankfully that beautiful plum tree of ours, which was here before we got here, uh, is fine to eat fruit from. And um, even plants like tomatoes and pumpkins are safe because they're fruiting crops um, essentially as well. But one of the issues that we've had is, um, of course, we want to have some sort of egg laying bird. <laughs> and when I first moved in, I was just so depressed that we couldn't have chickens. And it took me a while to realise that there are other creatures that lay eggs and that are beautiful company, but don't require such a large amount of space. And so what we've settled on are these um, gorgeous birds called Japanese quail. And um, they, of course, they scratch around in the soil and they you know, ingest some soil. So they're not inherently safe from leaded soil. But these birds, uh, where we keep them now, is actually in a small area that's on top of some old concrete um, paving stones. So they can't actually dig down into the leaded soil underneath and they're actually living in a layer of compost and mulch, um, which they're helping to create just on top of those um, concrete paving stones. Um, so I probably won't go into them in, in more detail <laughs> uh, as in the setup, but um, I thought you might enjoy some videos of them. Everybody loves a good quail video. Uh, and so uh, we've designed them quite carefully to have a minimal amount of work for us. And one of the ways that we do that is through this composted layer that they live on called deep litter. Um, a deep litter system absorbs their manure and uh, while they're scratching around in it, uh, it turns it into lovely rich compost. So we actually never have to clean out this area. We just scoop out compost that's all ready to go for our veggie bed. And it's amazing for us, of course, but it's also really, really amazing for the quail because the quail's whole reason to get up in the morning is to scratch around and look for little insects um, under their feet. So it's fabulous for the quail's mental health, um, for our entertainment, for the, the cat's entertainment, I would say as well, and um, also really minimal maintenance for us. So that's a win-win-win design solution. Uh, and we've really enjoyed having them. Okay, so that's a little bit more of a shot of the aviary. We've got worm farms in there too, which are in these bins here. Uh, another permaculture principle is integrating rather than segregating. And so in this case, rather than have our worm farms in one place and our quails in another place, we've combined the two of them so that we can have an efficient little daily routine of going in there with our scrap bucket from the kitchen, um, maybe feeding a little bit to the quail if it's something they'll like, throwing the rest in with the worms. Um, the quails get to eat any stray worms or insects that come out of the worm bins. They get very excited. Um, we throw in the compost scraps and then we pick up the eggs. Uh, and it's just one nice tight little routine that's really, really easy to manage. Uh, any worm juice that leaks out of those worm farms goes straight into the deep litter and it's captured and then put back on the garden. Um, okay, uh, we've also got a passion fruit vine in there that you can see. It's not super productive because the sun isn't really strong for it, but the quails really love to eat the leaves and it's a really nice green background that I can see from outside my study. Uh, so yeah, lo lots of little connections in there and I could go on, uh, but the key is we've tried to design it in a way that's really ethical for these beautiful animals that we keep. It keeps them happy and occupied and content and stress-free. And that translates into easier management for us, uh, less disease and, and sickness because you know they're strong and healthy birds um, and, and just less work for us in general um, because of the deep litter. 
Uh, they uh, love dust bathing. So <laughs> I have to show you this little video here. Everybody loves it. And um, in here, they've got just a small spoonful of wood ash that's from our slow combustion uh, stove inside. So that's um, providing us with uh, free heating and cooking and clothes drying and food drying and kettles and a, a toaster. <laughs> and then some of the byproducts of that are things like the ash that comes out into the quail aviary and helps to keep their feathers in good condition and helps to um, uh, impede any lice or mites. Uh, I've got see, a couple of questions in there. Do we eat the quail? Uh, we, we do occasionally. We don't raise them for meat. That's, that's not us. Um, doesn't suit us. Uh, but we do eat um, the occasional extra male that we breed and we eat quails at the end of their life um, uh, if we've got too many of them. Uh, but mostly they're there for eggs and company and we certainly have a lot of retirees that we, um, that we love that live a very long <laughs> life out there. Um, mostly contributing to our composting system. So Kat, just before you go on, there was a question mm -hmm. from Peter about do they breed naturally and you mentioned you get males, so I'm assuming you do. Um, oh, and the yeah. other question from Mike uh, was, there's very little info about keeping quails in the home garden. Do you have any recommended resources? Oh, thanks, Mel. Okay, so firstly, uh, these birds are not known for naturally breeding or going broody as we call it it's quite rare for them to sit on their own eggs. And that's a factor of them um, being selected for egg production. Uh, and along the way, people forgot to select for birds that would be um, natural mothers. <laughs> so unfortunately, we've got some birds now that are very good at laying eggs, not so good at raising their own chicks. We have had some birds go broody here, but it's not reliable. Um, and most of the time, if we know that we need chicks, then we'll have to raise them ourselves in an incubator. Uh, but we had one, one lady just recently who we call Ingrid Birdman and made a really determined effort to sit on some eggs. And unfortunately, they weren't fertile, so we didn't get any chicks at the end of that. Um, but yeah, sometimes you can be very lucky and get some, and that's great. Uh, but yes, there aren't many resources about keeping quail, Mike. I have actually uh, put a book about keeping quail in the Hobson's Bay library system. So there is a quick start guide, at least I know of, in there. Um, and sometimes we run workshops as well through my smart garden that I'm going to talk about at the end. There's also some very excellent Facebook groups and other social media groups that um, can answer questions and that sort of thing and crowdsource the responses that you need to have success. Uh, and Anna quails live, um, yeah, that they're quite short lived. So you're doing really well if they live past about three or four years and the productive egg laying life is around two to three years uh, in my experience. So um, that's one of their disadvantages. So you do have to have a plan for having young birds continually in your flock if you'd like to have a consistent supply of eggs. Um, so uh, I thought I'd show you the eggs of course here and one of the, the great joys the beautiful things that we produce here and um, the quail eggs can actually be substituted for anything that you would put a chicken egg in. The, the flavour is indistinguishable and people have no idea that they're eating quail eggs unless I tell them. Uh, the thing that you need to know though is that there are some scissors to help you open them because they would be incredibly inconvenient if you had to break each soft little egg one by one. So I'm going to play you this video that shows you how these um, quail egg scissors operate. Yeah so there you go when you want to make an omelette that's got eight to ten eggs uh, you do need a pair of quail egg scissors to get through that. Um, and those uh, scissors are very, very cheaply available on eBay for anyone who might go down this route. But anyway, this isn't meant to be a promotional spiel for quail. It's just um, showing you one uh, technique that we've used in a small space to get around some of our design challenges um, and, and doing that using a, a kind of permaculture uh, design approach. So that was a quick little tour of my place, the plumbery. And now I just want to show you a couple of other short uh, examples of food production in small spaces in the city. 
And um, one of them is a place called Abdullah House that my friend Richard Telford lives in, in Seymour. And actually all I have for you of this one is a photograph. So it's a very, very short case study, but um, the produce is really, really impressive. And I, I guess uh, it gives me a lot of heart that people consistently get these incredible produce tallies from small spaces uh, and with not 30 years of experience, maybe as little as five years of, of having a crack. And I do know some of the people who are in this meeting at the moment um, have got phenomenal systems as well. So we've really got this amazing pool of local knowledge and how to do this. Um, Richard's place is slightly larger than mine, um, not too much, definitely within the footprint of an average suburban garden and grew more than half a tonne of produce in 2018. Isn't that phenomenal? Um, so good on them. And I know Richard's got um, a website and um, some more information around what he does. Uh, another example on a much smaller scale that I wanted to show you is my friend Michael's courtyard. And now this is a rental example. So they're all things that are very, very cheap, low commitment, um, and um, many of them able to be moved, although not all of them. And so this is what his place looks like in Carlton. And you can see he's made these vegetable beds up just from scrap um, timber, a lot of it from pallets. He has lined them with some black plastic, which just helps to prolong the lifespan of that timber, which doesn't have any other kind of treatment. And he's used a bunch of um, larger pots and buckets and other tubs and things that he's found. Uh, to grow a pretty decent amount of food. Now, if you look at the sorts of crops that he's growing here, the, the focus is on herbs and it's on leafy greens. And for people who are getting started and for people who are in really small gardens, those tend to be the things that make the most sense for you to start growing. You'll get the highest yields with the least amount of experience and effort. And um, generally those are things that many of them can be grown without fantastic sun as well which is important for many people in small spaces um, now michael's garden also features lots and lots of raised beds and pots uh, this particular pot is made out of an old bathtub <laughs> and he's uh, of course made great use of a piece of fence as a trellis to grow things up from time to time uh, and it's a actually a wicking bathtub so it's got a little reservoir of water in the bottom, uh, which then is able to um, be like a, a glass of water for all the plants above it so they can drink from it whenever they like. And that's a great technique for people who are growing in pots and for people who live in southeastern Australia when um, uh, the, the heat waves kick in in summer. Um, Michael also has, uh, down in this bottom right hand corner, he's also got some makeshift water tanks which are very small and modular so they can be moved if he needs to move house. So he's found a, a series of these old olive drums and I think you can just see that he's hooked them up. So they're acting as one tank together. And that capacity there might be uh, only say 600 litres, but it's surprising how many times 600 litres will fill up from rain events. So it's certainly uh, a big step up from having no water tanks and allows him to um, make the most of some of that water that's coming off the roof as well. So I'm just gonna pause there and I can see Karen asked a question about quail eggs. Um, and Karen, it's about four to five quail eggs to make up a chicken egg. So I hope that helps in your calculations. Okay, so that was Michael's place very quickly. Uh, and now I have um, the pleasure of introducing you to uh, Rabia and Steve who are our Tona locals and who've been members of the My Smart Garden program for the last couple of years and um, I met them because Rabia was sending me some photographs and asking me some gardening questions and then I met them at some events and it turns out that they're just a phenomenal couple growing um, amazing amounts of produce uh, with only a couple of years of experience in a really small area. And they were so impressive that um, we introduced them to Gardening Australia and they got featured recently on the show. And so I have to just show you the whole segment. And in here, they've got a how-to for building wicking pots um, out of scrap materials that I hope you'll find um, interesting and helpful. The Great Australian Dream 
buy a nice little house, maybe do it up a bit, work on the garden. But the reality is, heaps of people actually rent for life. So what does that mean for the gardening prospects of the 30% of Australians who are on a lease? No garden? Or pour all your love into the garden and then leave it behind when the lease ends? It's not like you can pick the garden up and take it with you. Or can you? We're about to meet a couple whose productive patch is totally portable. In a small regional area near Holland. Rabia and Steve are renting a unit in Altona in Melbourne's west. Rabia is expecting a baby in a month or so, and Steve has a broken shoulder. But despite all that, they've still got the energy to show me around. Well, I don't really need to ask where your place begins because I can sense <laughs> that the food growing is happening right here. Yep. Yes, it's We're a strong indicator. Got to use all the space that we've got, basically. If this is what you've got in the driveway, I want to see what's in the courtyard. Is this the right way? Yep, yep. that's the way. Oh, so this is it. You've packed it full. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's not a lot of uh, paver space. What sort of stuff are you growing? Um, we do love our teas. We have a lot of lemon balm and mint. We're trying a native mint as well. Beetroot uh, in the corner there. And this year we're trying out eggplants, uh, seeing how, how it goes here. Um, tomatoes, um, they're always beautiful to have. And some shallots growing here too. This garden grows all of our salad greens, it grows all of our herbs, and we grow some, obviously, some of our vegetables from it as well. So around roughly about 50 kilos of produce. And how big a footprint is the growing area? If we were to take all these boxes and put them together, it would be about four square metres. Four square metres? Yeah, four square metres, <laughs> that's all. You think about your average household. Mm. they got a lot more than four square metres. Oh, absolutely. Mm. So it's... It's a great example of productivity in a small space. Yep, absolutely. So you're growing a lot of it in containers. Mm. Mm -hmm. Since we're renting, um, that's basically what we have to do because you can't really dig. Um, but at the same time, it gives us a lot of flexibility. You can take them with you when you move. So when you build up really good soil, you don't have to put in all that compost and, and all that effort and, and then you have to leave it behind, which is wonderful. Now, my compost alarm is going off at the moment. And the sensors are telling me that there's something going on over here in the corner. <laughs> Your compost alarm is correct. Uh, we have our composting system over here. It's completely portable. Costa, would you like to get in there and grab a bucket? you got a second arm there. I still think you could have done it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, for the buckets, we have some holes drilled up the top just to let air in, and we have some holes drilled at the bottom just for drainage. So... As you can see here, that's some of our finished compost. Oh. Basically, the great thing is if you need to move house, you can easily take the whole system with you. How much compost is your little system producing? Um, about half a tonne a year. And the great thing is that this system produces it in small amounts. So we obviously can't use half a tonne in one go here, so we can just use it as we need it. A portable garden like this relies on a bit of upcycling and DIY. So it's time to head to the garage to see how it's done. So is this your secret workshop? Yes. Where all the... Where all the, where all the magic happens. <laughs> so we're going to make a wicking bucket out of a 10 litre food grade bucket. Uh, basically a wicking bucket means that um, we don't have to water as often. So Costa, I'm going to need you to do some drilling for us. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So basically here, we've got agricultural poly pipe. We pre-made this where we use a little barbed irrigation joint. You can dip the ends of the poly pipe in boiling water, which just makes the pipe more malleable, a bit easier to, to hit over this barbed joint. So three holes, one inch apart. This will sit inside the bucket just here, almost two thirds of the way across the bucket, just to help spread the water out a bit more evenly. All right, so the next step is to make a drainage hole. This will then go in here, but we need to make a hole for that first. It's 25 mil, which is just a little bit smaller than the poly pipe we're going to use. And that makes a nice snug fit. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that looks really good. Yeah. Thanks. No uh, we need to make little slits here. It fits it through nicely. So, now, 
it through here. Yes. yes. Here we go. The next step now is that we put the filler pipe in. The aim is to have the filler pipe yeah, about 90 degrees from where the front pipe is. It just makes it easier when you're filling them up. And here we've got some scoria, so it's just there to stop the soil from working its way into the water reservoir. But it's also, it's volcanic rock, it's nice and hollow. So even with the scoria inside, uh, this can hold two litres of water. So we're going to put that in. Mm -hmm. We need to have enough scoria so it's just at the top of the drain pipe. So covering to the high side. That's right. The uh, next step is we put a weed mat in it so the soil doesn't get mixed up with the scoria. I suppose when you find your plant outgrows this side of bucket, you can ideally, you know, uh, lift the soil out in one go and then move it into a new one. Yeah. Great idea. The next step would be to put the soil in together with the compost. So how many times have you moved this portable setup? Well, we moved it, like the whole garden, we moved once last year when we moved into this unit here. Um, but I guess we move the buckets around quite frequently. If, um, you know, the weather changes, the sun changes and so on, um, we just pick it up and move it. What do you reckon? Yeah, that's pretty that good. good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you want to plant in this one? Oh, I reckon parsley. Yep. We could use parsley. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And what number is it? How many of these have you got now? I reckon this is number 40. So you'll be able to take number 40 with you, if ever you move. Yeah, all yeah. 40 of them. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oop, just jumped a bit there. How is that, folks? Pretty amazing, hey? Um, really uh, impressed with the system they've got, especially their compost system. And half a tonne of um, compost a year. It grows some pretty impressive silver beet. <laughs> so those um, buckets that they showed you in there, are all from an Indian restaurant around the corner from where they live. Those um, buckets are how the restaurant gets things like ghee and other ingredients coming in in catering size quality quantities. And um, they're very happy to see them go to good use rather than getting wasted. Uh, so it's very easy to find those buckets for free if you ask around. Um, so uh, they'll grow one silver beet plant per bucket. And um, yes, the most impressive little garden I've seen for some time. So uh, that completes the uh, case study section of tonight. And I hope there's something in there for everyone um, that you'd like to try at home and lots of ideas. The last little session that I want to do is just, um, just some really, really fast uh, basic beginners tips for those of you who might be just dipping your toe in and wanting to get started. And um, the first thing I wanted to mention, it's the classic organic gardening advice, and it's still the best, which is to focus a lot on your soil. And soil can seem pretty inert, um, boring stuff when you're getting started. And the more you learn about it, the more there is to know, and the more you understand how it's a living thing full of billions and billions of microorganisms, most of them essential uh, to your health and to the plant's health. So uh, we can't, in this session tonight, talk about how to um, really maintain uh, great soil, but the resources that I'm about to introduce you to will help you to do that. And um, the only thing that I'll say tonight is just that uh, cycling organic matter around your garden is the most important thing that you can do to have healthy soil. And so you've seen some examples of that in um, Rabia and Steve's garden. That's the compost that they're continually adding back to their soil. Uh, and compost is great to add in quite large quantities, say about an inch or two inches across the whole surface of your pot or your bed every time that you're planting and your vegetables. And um, the very best stuff is the stuff that you make yourself. And that's something that we can help you with in My Smart Garden as well. So looking after your soil is fundamental to um, getting crops and reducing your pest problems and increasing your yields and so on. The other, um, you know, secret that's not a secret is that water is really, really important for getting good production. And I know these are possibly the two most boring tips that I could give you, but water is one that seems to be overlooked a lot, um, especially by home gardeners getting started. And so I love to show people this photograph of um, carrots from our garden. This is the same type of carrot planted in the same bed at the same time, uh, same row. And the only difference between the carrots at the top and the carrots at the bottom is that the ones on the bottom were on the edges of the bed where they dried out um, periodically throughout the season. 
So it really, you know, it's not um, a secret, but you, you have to get water right. And um, most home gardens that I visit are really chronically underfed, as in with organic matter, and underwatered as well. So if you're just getting started, the um, uh, you know, essential tool is just your finger and poking your finger into the soil around the root zone and trying to keep that as about a damp sponge, a damp kitchen sponge for as much of that season as you possibly can for annual vegetables. Um, and most of our vegetables, are domesticated, cultivated vegetables, um, will do really, really well with a damp sponge type moisture. So very quick and very basic tips, I know. We're just moving on now to the things to plant now for people who are um, staring at a box of seeds or at a nursery shelf wondering what's the best thing to be putting in. At this point in the year, the weather is really getting colder. I don't need to tell you that, of course. What that means for plants is that they are starting to slow down in their growth. So if you are planting really large um, vegetables now, like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower and kale, it's going to take them quite a long time to get up to the size where you would harvest them. That's not a bad thing, but sometimes that is um, not harvesting until spring and you may want that space free for more exciting things like tomatoes in the springtime. So just know that if you're putting some of those larger veggies in now, it's probably a little bit later than ideal unless you've got a big garden and you can let them grow well into spring um, and harvest them then. So if you've got a small space and you're impatient, you want some nice quick results, the sorts of things that I would recommend are the things in the top. Things like silver beet and rocket, uh, wild rocket, which is a different plant, different species, uh, but actually much hardier and um, longer lasting uh, and much more resilient once it's going. Uh, radish, lots of your Asian greens like bok choys, um, tatsoi and so on. Good old lettuce, uh, mustard, mizuno, which is a type of mustard, and endives and radicchios. So you've got yourself your cooking greens in there and lots of really, really fancy salad. <laughs> and they're um, great things to be starting with if you're starting to, um, to garden. Um, okay, so I've got basically um, out of the way the things that I wanted to cover in tonight's session. The last thing that I wanted to do is point you towards some places where you can learn more, um, acknowledging that I've just really scratched the surface of um, getting started growing gardens. So one of the resources that you have available to you in Hobson's Bay and throughout the western suburbs of Melbourne is this program that I run called My Smart Garden. Now, this is a free council run program that exists to help you get more out of your garden. Uh, so that could be food, that could be shading and sheltering your house in summer or providing wildlife and um, native plants with habitat. Um, it could be reducing your waste and getting those cycles going with grey water and compost. It could be lots of different things, um, but certainly lots and lots of food production advice. So I know some of you are, are real regulars in the program, so hello to you out there. If you haven't heard of the program before, you can jump on the website and um, see the events that we've got coming up. And you can also connect with us on Instagram where I'll be answering questions and putting up uh, some seasonal tips and that sort of thing. The other resource that you've got available to you is this book called Retro Suburbia. Um, and I have to just give a little disclaimer that I'm a case study in there and so I'm probably a little bit biased. Uh, but Retro Suburbia is a book that has been written by David Holmgren who is the co-originator of the permaculture concept. And um, this book is written for people in southeastern Australia who live in cities and suburbs. So it's how do we adapt these spaces to support us better, um, particularly through difficult times, which of course we're living through right now. So it's not just about food, but it's also about the built environment. It's about our behaviours. Uh, turning us into a more resilient culture that's going to be able to ride out some of these bumpy times that we've got ahead. Now, uh, it's a huge manual of a book. Um, there are five copies of it in Hobson's Bay Libraries, Mel tells me, and the libraries are doing book deliveries. So I think that means you can actually get one dropped off at your house, which is quite exciting. The other thing to know, though, is that they have just released this as an online version where you pay as you feel. 
So it's not the same as it being free, but you are able to pay what you are able to afford and what you think it's worth to have access to this um, nearly 600 page uh, book. So um, hopefully that makes it accessible to more people. Um, that's the goal. And um, it's there as a, a kind of source of inspiration and um, showing you some of the other patterns that um, people like these case studies that we've talked about have used to um, create these permaculture systems. Um, okay, so that brings me to the end of the, um, the I guess, formal part of the session. So I can't um, see many of you, but I hope that that was useful to you and um, look forward to welcoming you back face to face in some of our events uh, at the time where that becomes um, possible and safe again. And so Mel, you're going to join, um, join me now, I guess, in um, facilitating some questions um, before we uh, close up the session. Is that right? Absolutely, I will, Kat. Um, so there's some questions I've been jotting down as we've been going along. Um, so so I'll, I guess if, if you have one of the questions and you'd like to ask it, I might just um, put it out to you. So Tanya, um, you had a question earlier. If Tanya's still in, did you want to unmute yourself to ask your question? Uh, hi, hi there. Hi, thank you very much for your time, Kat, and um, nice seeing you. I've come to a few of the My Smart Gardens and they are awesome. Um, oh, sorry, I should video it too. Sorry. Uh, with my picture. I look like a random person. I had a baby earlier, so I didn't want to be in the video. Um, earlier today? Yes, just now. Um, <laughs> uh, just a very quick one about um, cats. We have a lot of um, neighbourhood cats that shouldn't be but are let out at random types of the night. Um, and I'm worried because we've got two young children to have, it's the hygienic factor of having vegetables and it being a potential cat litter place for um, other neighbourhood cats. Um, I, I've read about the electric fence, the electric tape. Yeah. So that works with cats because, yeah, so, yeah. That, that, so a few people mentioned that. So I thought, Yeah, it does, absolutely. So, yeah, it's sold to include or exclude cats, um, dogs, uh, possums, and presumably other animals as well, but they're the ones that most people care about. Yeah. Um, the other thing, Tanya, is um, you can, of course, create um, cages or nets that will keep cats out of a vegetable garden area. Yeah. And there is a design, if you have enough space to do it, called a floppy fence, which is very helpful and um, lower tech than the ping string. Um, so um, what I can do actually if it's, I hope it's interesting for other people as well. I'll go into a whiteboard and I will do a quick um, diagram of a, of a floppy fence. Great. Um, hopefully you can see this. If anybody's been out to Werribee Zoo, they're the fences that um, surround the property to keep the foxes out out there. So that might be, oh, that's good might to be fam f familiar with them if you've been out there at all. Awesome. Cool, so I'm getting good at doing freehand drawings of this um, with the teaching. I'm going to... Great picture, Kat, I love it. I hope it's sort of um, entertaining, like just the, the way it unfolds in front of you. I, I suspect it's better than me drawing on a whiteboard because then I can sometimes do text and you don't have to read my handwriting. Um, so, yeah, so this is a floppy fence and they're used for animals that like to uh, climb fences or burrow under fences. So if you've got burrowing animals, people often put a horizontal part under the ground. And then there's a solid piece of fence, which is this vertical bit. And then the top of the fence is floppy, hence the name. And so of course the possum comes along and tries to climb up the solid part of the fence, but can't make it around the floppy bit at the top. And as long as there's no overhanging branches or trees or anything it can use to get over that, and as long as the vertical part of the fence is high enough and uh, that's a really really simple low-tech way of keeping uh, lots of animals out of a food garden. Uh, obviously you need a little bit of space around the garden to be able to do that so it's not always as um, easy in the city which is why we've ended up with the electric fence version. But that's something that um, may or may not be relevant to you. <laughs> Thank you very much that's great. No problem. Thank you. Um... Andrew, you had a question about grey water plumbing. Is Andrea still online and would like to ask her question? No, Hello. maybe not. Um, oh, yeah, go for it. Hello, I was just wondering whether you need to um, invest in 
finding a hydraulic engineer and, or a um, specialist plumber or whether it's possible to um, just retrofit with some um, tubes and pipes that you buy yourself at a local hardware shop. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of... Um definitely lots of good DIY grey water systems out there. I think if you do any changes to your official house plumbing, you are supposed to involve um, a plumber. So, so keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, for things like a, say a clothes washing machine, there are great simple systems where you just use the outlet pipe of the washing machine and have that going out. Um, and that of course doesn't require any um, necessarily any change to your internal house plumbing. Uh, so it is quite important. I, I should just also mention some safety things around grey water. Uh, I mentioned I think that you shouldn't store it for longer than 24 hours or at all if you can help it because there will be some pathogens like you know the occasional fecal particle or something that ends up in that water and over 24 hours they can breed up to quite significant levels uh, in there just like any other bacteria would um, building up in, in water over time. Uh, so you quickly take something that's pretty safe and turn it into something that's not safe. And so it's very important that you don't store grey water and don't hold it in any kind of tank for a period of time. And the other thing is it needs to go into healthy soil, preferably sub subsurface, so that no child or um, any other human or animal can um, dip its finger or paw in there and then eat it. Um, so the simpler systems tend to be the best and having it going into mulch um, pits in the ground underneath a fruit tree is really, really safe and appropriate um, and simple. Uh, so again, I'll just point you towards Art Ludwig and his blog uh, website, Oasis Design. He also has a book called, um, well, what's it called? I popped a link to it in uh -huh. the comments. Um... Actually, no, I didn't pop a link to that one. I popped a link to the urban um, quail keeping one in the um, in the chat. So let me, I will find the Art Ludwig one and pop a link to that in there as well. Thank you, Mel. And I know that, um, that there's also a copy of his Greywater book in the Hobson's Bay Library system that I put there as well. So um, again, you can access that without having to buy the book. Um, and it's got some really good um, simple systems in there. Yep. We've got a few books by him um, in the Enviro Centre collection. Um, now, uh, we had another question as well. Um, Edge, you had a question about your high pH clay soil. Edge, are you on there anywhere? Yes, hi, I'm here. <laughs> All right, thanks for the opportunity to ask the question. Let me just... Hi. Um, I've actually watched your that um, Gardening Australia plumery um, feature as well as um, Reba and Stevens. I've watched that before, but um, yeah, I have um, I have a really alkaline soil everywhere. So my dream of an edible garden is kind of crumbling at the moment. I'm growing in containers in the meantime. But do you have any suggestions as to what I can do? Because there's a lot of resources on how to increase soil pH for acid loving plants like blueberries but I haven't found mm -hmm. too many for a home gardener like myself to decrease the pH. Sure yep um, okay so it's it's quite rare for soils in this part of the world to be naturally alkaline. Um, it can happen especially if it's a soil that's had building work done and they've um They've thrown concrete dust and mortar around, which are highly alkaline, and that's been mixed in with the soil. Yep, it uh, is a new home. It's a new home. Okay, so that's probably why. And I was just going to mention the other thing that can happen, which is lots of fresh compost. And fresh compost often has an incredibly high pH that will gradually settle back over time towards neutral. Uh, and, and actually, for anyone who's listening who isn't familiar with soil pH, this is a measure of how acid or how alkaline your soil is. And most plants prefer a range of about six and a half to seven and a half, which is around neutral. Outside of that range, they find it really difficult to access all the nutrients that they need. Uh, and so balancing pH is one of those tricks with soil um, that we talk a lot about in My Smart Garden and we um, provide some advice on. So if you know your soil is kind of permanently in that highly alkaline range, 
Um, firstly, that's a bummer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, the way that you can try to bring it down reliably is with elemental sulfur. I'll type that for you in the chat. Um, now, yeah, so home gardeners often try things like pine needles and coffee grounds. Um, so you're welcome to try those as well. And they might have a small effect, but if you're talking a very large pH imbalance, they're probably not strong enough to do yeah. that. Uh, so elemental sulfur is what um, would be used professionally to amend soil. Yeah. Uh, now the, the issue with it is that it can take a couple of months to have effect because it needs to be processed by soil biology before the acidifying effect takes place. And it may not be permanent either, unfortunately. I can't give you good advice on how long it will last for, but it's probably worth a go if, um, if you're staying there for a long time. Yeah, so I'll probably have to keep doing that um, continuously, possibly from... You may have to. I'm sorry, I don't have much experience in um, yep. how long yep. that effect will last for. Uh, yep. And just finally, it's, it's easiest to find elemental sulfur if you go to a pet supply or a, a feed stock supply place. Um, yep. you can get it as one of the, um, in, often in bulk bins, um, as well, okay. it's, um, much cheaper getting it as an animal food supplement than it is getting it as a, um, a soil amendment. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. All the best. Thank you for that one. Um, Emma, you had a question about vertical gardens. I did. Um, Kat, I was wondering if you had any advice? Um, or recommendations for plants that would work well in a vertical garden environment? Mm. Yeah, vertical gardens, um, it, it depends a lot on the gardener. In fact, I think it depends mostly on the gardener. So vertical gardens uh, are fantastic, of course, in limited spaces. And if I had a balcony, I'd certainly have a vertical garden. The challenges that people have with them are that they dry out really quite quickly, most designs. And so you're really limited to how often are you watering? And if you're not watering, what can get away without having consistent moisture? Um, so if you, you aren't going to be watering it regularly, then people find that um, really hardy Mediterranean herbs with relatively small root systems like um, oregano, marjoram, thyme, sage, that sort of thing tends to go okay. Uh, if you are watering it regularly, then you just have to deal with um, the small root volume in the relatively compact um, space. And so then, um, you know, you could grow like quite a lot of leafy greens like rocket and lettuce, um, try things like mizuna. Um, you, could, you could grow silver beet, it'll probably be a dwarf silver beet, but you can grow lots of it, so that would probably be okay. Um, things like land cress as well. Um, yeah, so lo actually lots of those quick growing leafy greens that I had up on that slide earlier will be good for you, Emma. Uh, but it really you. depends on how, how often you're watering that, that space. Uh, Kim had a question about shade. Kim, are you out there? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I'm just wondering um, what you'd recommend I grow. I've got quite a shady garden. Um, big trees and I'm wondering what kind of produce I could plant in those areas. Mm. Um, for shady areas, leafy greens are your friend. They often end up growing larger leaves because they're trying to enlarge their solar panels, um, i.e. their leaves to find more sun. So uh, again, actually most of the things I had in that quick growing list will be good for you. Um, you may also like to consider if it's very shady, becoming a mushroom farmer and growing some mushrooms instead of um, plants. Um, and uh, I think I mentioned briefly, we've been growing oyster mushrooms using some um, hardwood shavings here. And um, you could also look at growing some shiitakes on logs, uh, those sorts of things. And um, when we hopefully get back to normal society, there's these great things called food swaps where you can take your surplus and exchange it for other people's surplus. And I think particularly for people who've got real limitations on their growing space, uh, being able to grow something in large quantities, uh, even if you can't use all of it, like leafy greens, and then take it to a swap and get something that needed more sun. It's a really um, lovely way to um, balance out some of your uh, disadvantages. Thank you. 
<laughs> Leanne, are you still with us? You had a question as well. No. Hello. Oh, yep. Go ahead, Leanne. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Working in the system. I um, have a son who's eight and we are just new to the sustainability journey, but we're wanting to and have tried but failed miserably because I certainly don't have a green thumb to grow simple herbs. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we're wondering, I guess, what would be good to plant at this time um, what would be easy to grow and how we could start? Mm -hmm. um, well, at this time of year, uh, a lot of, or most of your perennial herbs can go in. They'll just grow quite slowly until the warm weather kicks in again. So yep. the, um, the only things, just to say the ones I wouldn't plant now, uh, yep. are obviously things like um, basil, which requires really warm temperatures. But most of your other common herbs, um, like um, parsley and mints and, you know, all the rosemary, sage, oregano, thyme, um, yeah. mushroom, uh, garlic chives, all of those you could put in now for sure. So it's actually a good time of year to be planting herbs. Brilliant. And just and, in um, normal pots or in, yeah. in, the, in the garden or a raised sort of a bed, what's sort of the best conditions for or area to grow that? Yeah, those ones... Um, are pretty good in lots of different conditions. Okay. Um, pots will dry out more quickly in summer, so um, they are okay for things like rosemaries and sages that deal with drier soil. Sometimes yep. if you have mint in a pot and you don't have a dripping tap above it or anything like that, you'll struggle to keep it moist through the summer. So those things I'd plant in the ground um, if, I, if I had a choice for sure. And uh, Leanne, now is the time as well. It's a good time for coriander, which is one that people often want to grow. Uh, yeah. I like to grow into the cooler weather rather than the hotter weather. So if you plant it now, it'll last longer before it wants to rush and produce seed. Uh, so Thank that's you. Brilliant. Good Thank luck. you so much, Ta. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to throw back to Emma, who's been inspired by the mushrooms. I am. I was just wondering... You were mentioning that you could grow the mushrooms on logs. Would, would you be able to do logs in like a vertical garden style stack? Would that work? Yeah, potentially. So um, mushrooms, it's all about whether you can keep the moisture levels right. So again, um, thinking about whether you've got blazing hot sun or you've got a shady space and whether you'll be there to keep them nice and moist. Um, but certainly the traditional way of growing shiitake is is with the logs upright, leaning against something for support. Uh, but yeah, fairly compact space, so that could be something that works for you. And um, the oyster mushrooms that my partner's been having a crack at are grown in those food grade plastic buckets that you saw uh, Rabia and Steve making great use of. And you can actually create towers of them all stacked up. <laughs> so they're pretty great for a vertical context as well. Um, and, and using waste products in the um, sawdust or the wood shavings in them and also the buckets as well. Mm. Um, and I'm going to throw in a recommendation there for one of our books in our collection, Milkwood uh, by Kirsten Bradley has a great section on growing mushrooms in there. So um, might be a good one to, to order um, to be delivered. <laughs> Now, I think the only other questions that we have left are about whether the video and the PowerPoint presentations are going to be made available. So if anybody has questions out there, please feel free to pop them in or just give me a, um, a hand raise so I can see you've got a question to ask. Um, but I just realised, Kat, this wasn't something we spoke about earlier, was it? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Happy to share them. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll figure out a way um, and... Um, keep an eye out maybe on our website um, but yeah we'll uh, we'll get those available to you as well um, so we've got a question council regulations for grey water oh it's a great question Christine so I should know that off the top of my head but I actually don't um, so I'm very happy uh, if you want to email um, Mel if you've got her email address handy or mine if you do have it and I'll just double check for Hobson's Bay because those regulations do change um, depending on the council area. So I want to make sure I give you the right advice there. Thank you very much for answering. For some reason, my video isn't working. I appreciate that. 
No worries. I'm just going to pop in um, the library email. So if you want to email me, we can um, get the answer to that back to you as well. Um, what else? Questions? So it's 7.50 now, Mel. I just forget when we were... Um... Yep, we, yes, we are probably, and which is a good thing because there aren't actually any other questions coming up there. So I think that actually um, is a pretty t good time for us uh, to wrap up. What I might do, um, oh, somebody's commented that they're loving the story time and the baby bounce videos as well. And we, um, my colleagues at the library have been doing amazing work getting uh, content out to everybody. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to take a print screen of, um, I've got, I think, 25 boxes on my screen right now. Um, so if you would like to share your video, only if you want to, no pressure, you don't have to, um, but it's just such a, a great opportunity to get everybody um, that's out there. So if you would, if you don't mind, um, I'm just going to take a, a, a screenshot of, um, of all your amazing faces. And it's so nice to see some, some familiar people who I haven't seen for a little while. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Excellent. I'm just going to make sure that that has come across. Nope, it hasn't. <laughs> we can take screenshots from the video later, Mel. So oh, okay, excellent. There, there you go. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, please get in touch on the library email if you do have any other questions from tonight. Um, but thank you. And we look forward to, to getting some more EnviroCentre events up and running online. So if you're not on our newsletter, uh, jump onto the website and register for the newsletter. Keep an eye on our social medias. And if you're not on the MySmart Garden newsletter as well, jump onto um, the, the My Smart Garden website and join that newsletter too. Thank you all very much um, and we'll see you next time, whether online or in the library. We'll wait and see what happens next. Thanks guys. <laughs>